right, welcome back everyone after that rather short break. Um, so we're gonna carry right on with our second to last paper of today. And that is with Dr. Martin Robson from the University of Exeter. So Dr. Martin Robson is a senior lecturer in strategic studies and head of top programs at the Strategy and Security Institute at the University of Exeter. He specializes in the utility of history for contemporary application and his research focuses on the formulation and implementation of British policy and grand strategy. His historical work encompasses numerous aspects of 18th and 19th century naval and military history in a global context, including aspects of sea power, joint operations, and economic warfare. Dr. Robson has been involved with civilian and military education at undergraduate and postgraduate levels since 2008. During his career, he has worked as an advisor to the Royal Navy's Maritime Warfare Center and has also worked with the MOD's Development Concepts and Doctrine Center, the Met Office, and the National Archives. Uh, really happy to have you with us, uh, Martin, and with no further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Anna, and um, good evening to everybody. And um, I caught the end of the, of the previous discussion, which was quite interesting, and, and in great comment about uh, more discussions about the First World War. So I'm going to caveat that with the fact that I'm actually not going to talk about 1914 to 1918, largely because um, if I look at international law and discussions and debates about international law with reference to the South Atlantic, I think there is a clear recognition, certainly on, on the side of Germany, on the side of, of Great Britain, that international law had probably run its course by the time we get to 1914, in the sense that international law had put the concept of international maritime law had broken down, and we can see that in some of the decisions enacted. Um, I'll also caveat further that I am not a, a lawyer. My job here, as part of my job here, I teach uh, students on a third year law module, and I see my job as undermining their faith in the, in the concept of international law, because strategists and the role of the applied strategist is to find the workaround, is to find the loophole, is to find the way to achieve national interests um, within an international um, law construct, but certainly to, to look for opportunities, to bend the rules, maybe. And one of the other things I wanted to, to, to consider in the, in the sort of like the long pull through of this subject is the development, certainly following the Declaration of Paris in 1856, which has been welcomed by Anne Lenniter. Um, then into certainly the first Hague Conference of 1899, but specifically the second Hague Conference of 1907 and, and the London Conference of late 1808 to 1809. And the follow up to that in terms of decision making um, in a strategic concept. And why South America? Why the South Atlantic? Why does this matter? Um, well, it's an area where Britain and uh, Germany both conflicted over international maritime law. And what I'm going to largely be looking at today are concepts of the utility of auxiliary cruisers wrapped into concepts of, of a girder of force. Um, and again, why South America in that context? Well, it's where you can see the information of policy and naval strategy in a globalized context. We get the combination of trade and finance and concepts of economic warfare, which I think is, is really important in the thinking about economic warfare in this period. Um, I might talk for a little bit longer than 20 minutes. If I do, I apologize. Um, but I'm sure Greg or Anna will probably shout at me and I'll find more stumps at a suitable point. And again, the South Atlantic and South America is really quite interesting because we're not necessarily talking about huge tracts of formal empire, either for Germany and certainly not, not for Great Britain. But we're looking at how you project power in an area where you have significant trading and economic interests. And certainly from a British perspective, in terms of finance to start off with, when we look at British um, overseas investments in places like uh, the Dominions and the Dependent Empire, um, by the time we get to 1913, 1914, they're totaling you know, about 1.76 billion a year, the largest of which um, is within Canada, which is over 500 million per year. Um, but Latin America as a whole received more UK investment than a single Dominion in 1913 to 1914. About 1.18 billion pounds. I mean, this is a significant amount of British capital tied up overseas. Um, significant in that is Argentina. Um, in 1910, British investment in Argentina amounted to about 290, 269 million pounds, and by 1913, it had risen to 357 million pounds, and was approaching 500 million on the eve of the First World War. And 
what's crucial here is that this trade is growing and it's new capital that's being invested to um, and being attracted to Argentina. And if we look at the years 1907 to 1913, about 118 million pounds of new British capital investment is being attracted to that country. Key here is trade. And while by the time we get to 1912, the United States is Britain's largest trading partner with a total import and export trade of about 186 million, that's followed by British India and Germany sitting third, um, perhaps raising some questions there about uh, concepts of economic interdependence um, in terms of, you know, countries who are linked together economically don't fight each other. Um, well, yes, they do, uh, because national interests often trump this and strategic interests. And while Argentina is further down the list of trading partners, I mean, it's only sitting at about 48 million pounds per year, um, you know, British investments are about 60% of all investments in Argentina. So it's a key trading partner. Now, it's not just the value of the trade, it's the strategic nature of this trade that is concerning British naval thinkers and planners pre first thing of the First World War, set in the context of, in, of international maritime law. In the years before the First World War, the UK was the largest importer of food in the world, importing um, about, uh, sorry, I just need to, <laughs> about um, more than half its food by value and at least 58% of its calories. Significantly, it's the South American, Latin American um, food supply here, which is key. Um, between 1909 and 1913, grain imports accounted for 78.7 cents a week for flour consumption um, in Great Britain. And Argentina was the second largest foreign supplier outside of the Dominions by the United States. But 60% of the Argentinian wheat trade, destined for Britain, was controlled by four big German firms. And by the time we get to 1913, the British Minister of Buenos Aires, Sir Reginald Power, is warning the F um, Foreign Office that you know, this German control of trade is giving them a stranglehold of the sinews of, the, of a future British war effort, i.e. food supplies. And what goes for, for wheat also goes for meat. And between 1909 and 1913, imported meat accounted for about 35 to 40% of meat consumption in Britain. In 1907, uh, Britain obtained the majority of its wheat from the USA, but by 1911, the largest supply was Argentina, accounting for about 16% of the British um, import trade, mainly as frozen beef. 61% um, um, of this was shipped from the River Plate itself, and for frozen um, and chilled beef, South America supplied 82.6% of the British imports, which is about nearly 30% of domestic consumption. To the Argentinian supply must be added meat imports, which came from places like New Zealand, around the Cape Horn, and followed the South American trade routes, uh, leading the official historian of the Great War and Seaborne Trade to calculate from official figures that in the years of peace, 84% of the beef and 67% of mutton imports into Britain came from or through South American waters. And in a broad sense, about 40% of British meat and wheat imports came from this route. And the river plate had become an irreplaceable source of food for the United Kingdom by 1914. To start to add some naval granularity to this, um, it's got to be moved somehow. And here, obviously, merchant shipping in Britain, dominance of merchant shipping was, was, was important. Uh, conventional figures point to British shipping in 1914 being about 45 to 55% of global shipping, so a significant domination of the market. And the trade itself is housing large ocean going vessels of over 3,000 gross registered tons. They're the, they're the ships moving this stuff around. And of course, Britain and our allies controlled nearly 80% of this uh, shipping, and that provided the vital means to conduct the trade itself. In terms of South American nations, the South American aspect of the trade, or the exports, was entirely dependent upon foreign registered shipping. In 1910, Britain owned 56% of shipping tonnage entering Argentinian ports. And by 1912, only about 61% of the tonnage of Buenos Aires, with Germany lagging well behind with only 12%. But from this period on, German trade and German shipping numbers um, in South Atlantic and the South Atlantic and South American ports start to increase. For the meat trade, key was refrigerated shipping, um, and that kept the supply chain flowing between the River Plate and the UK. By 1914, there were 200 British steamers working in the refrigerated trade alone, so that was not all on the South American route. 
of course, as a strategist, the thing that immediately pops out is auxiliary cruisers or potential auxiliary cruisers here. So, what is the German threat in, in British eyes? Um, well, Germany was seeing significant growth in its import export trade with Latin America from about 1902 onwards. And while Britain maintained a lead, it was losing out in relative percentage terms. One with the United States, given ambiguity over the United States' role in any future European conflict, and significantly with Germany. And German trade is growing. Um, and along with that, the growth of German shipping. Um, by the time we get to 1912, uh, Germany was planning to use naval training vessels to join with the West African squadron uh, and to be equipped as auxiliary cruisers. And German planners are also thinking about mobilizing the, the commercial vessels, vessels such as those of the Hamburg South American Line, the um, HSBG, um, as auxiliary cruisers, fitting them out with naval officers and, and, and arms. And um, a number of warnings come out from the area um, to the Admiralty about the concern and the growing concern of a danger posed by a significant port of German shipping in this region. You must remember that by 1914, Germany possessed the world's second largest merchant shipping marine with more than 5 million tons of shipping sailing under the German flag. Um, clearly, huge potential for auxiliary cruising on a greater force. Um, so, how do the British respond to this threat? Well, the initial response is strategic, not legal, focusing upon an offensive strategy to attack German merchant shipping, therefore removing the danger of Germany converting these ships to auxiliary cruisers at source. Um, this would be done by utilizing Royal Navy cruisers in both defensive and offensive roles. In April 1905, there's an Admiralty Conference on Commerce War, which rules out convoy rules out patrolling and focuses instead upon positioning cruiser squadrons of strategic nodes. And the Admiralty considered that the German good, of course, uh, could not be effective. But of course, we roll on you know, nearly a decade and with the enhanced numbers of German shipping, um, the situation starts to change. Um, a number of Naval War College uh, games simulate German cruisers or auxiliary cruisers wreaking havoc upon German, um, upon British commerce. Um, South Atlantic, and the 1907 war plans uh, delegate the suppression of German trade in the South Atlantic uh, to, to cruisers stations um, in places like the Cape and Sierra Leone. But it's the Hague Convention of 1907, which offers a different route, not the strategic route, but the legal route. And picking up upon some of the previous conversations, uh, clearly this, the, the idea of you know, Hague um, formulating some kind of um, consensus on international law um, doesn't hold up to expectations. Why? Because national interests trump concepts of international law. Um, German thinking clearly focuses upon the ability of the auxiliary cruisers and the dangers that they pose to British shipping. So, of course, they, they will not give up um, their desire to outfit and take into naval service merchant shipping at sea. And this is the key, the ability to do this on the high seas rather than in port. So when this starts to break down, this leads to essentially two options. Do you continue the strategist route, which is again using Royal Navy cruisers in that offensive defensive role, and it's certainly a, 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 a loosening of international law, or do you start to think about arming your own uh, merchant ships as a, as a symmetrical response to the potential German threat? Um, after 1907, um, you know, British naval thinkers are thinking that the legal route is still an option, and you can see the development of this between Hague in 1907 and into um, planning for um, the London Conference um, in late 1908 and into 1909. And it's interesting thinking about the nature of um, the Goethe course, which is often seen as, a, as an asymmetrical response to, to a dominant battle fleet. Whereas when you look at the example of this in the South Atlantic, what you see is the Goethe Corps becoming ever more important in British thinking in this offensive role to, 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 to negate German shipping and remove the threat of them being converted to auxiliary cruisers. But on the other side of the coin, almost um, the symmetrical response of arming British merchant ships to take on that defensive role, to deny um, Germany 
um, the, the ability to interdict those absolutely crucial um, food-based sea lines of communication. So we move on to um, the London Conference uh, of 1808 to 1809, where there are a number of divergent views um, and practices amongst the nations of the world. And things like contraband, which we, we've heard about, blockade, continuous voyage, uh, mutual vessels, rules for price, um, prizes, the rules for ships. Um, feel, crucially here, the legality of the conversion of merchant ships to warships on the high seas, etc. And the British government, British naval thinkers go into the conference hoping that there will be some agreement upon these vexed issues. But of course, the Germans will not budge. They want to retain the right to transform merchant ships on the high seas into warships. And from here on, we can see the failure of the ability of nations to agree on international law being, um, being a key driver in further thinking about the strategic use of auxiliary cruisers uh, from, from a German perspective and both a British perspective. In essence, Britain is looking with its global interests, its focus upon the growing threat in the, in the North Sea, um, in European waters, about how to um, protect an absolutely vital supply line with not enough resources. And clearly the obvious option is to take up, um, is to take up um, merchant shipping and convert them into um, auxiliary warships. There's a huge amount of intelligence gathering that starts to happen after London. Um, from 1909, in the summer of 1909, um, HMS Amethyst is sent into South American waters to conduct a uh, systematic intelligence gathering exercise from British merchant shipping about the growing presence of German merchant shipping, and to also um, gauge a, um, a perspective upon the value of the trade. And by the time that we get to 1911, where there have been three formalized positions um, at Pernambuco, Cape Verde Islands, and in Montevideo, where British officers are in that intelligence gathering role, we can see that the growing menace of the German auxiliary cruisers is, is, is being a bit large in, in British thinking about this. Um, during peacetime, there's only generally one Royal Navy light cruiser on the, on the South African station. Um, and the Admiral placed their hopes in the fact that much of the British shipping could actually outrun um, its pursuers, which is not necessarily a great strategic response. Um, and almost by the time that we get to 1912, the Admiral would sort of close its eyes to South America, following the example of maybe the Committee for Imperial Defense, uh, the Foreign Office, and the rest of the UK, just at a time when the German threat of auxiliary cruisers was growing to be um, of significant concern. And so the symmetrical response from British naval thinkers is to turn to this concept of defensively armed merchant ships down. Um, the Duff Committee report in May 1912 considered the effect German commerce raiding might have on food supplies and the resultant panic in the UK, which is exactly the intended effect um, in German naval thinking. That would lead to a rise in insurance rates, prices, food shortages, etc. All of those vexed issues that sit apart of, of um, concept of economic warfare. Um, so, what happens? Well, um, the first trial ship is the Royal Mail Steam Packet um, Company Aragon, which is sent to um, South America on the 25th of December 1912, armed with um, a couple of 4.7 inch guns. And it gets delayed and finally sets out in 1913. Um, the concept being that um, you know, adding uh, either mountains or um, the ability to hold um, 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 guns will be enough to deter German surface raiders. Um, because, of course, with, you know, with the submarine sitting as an unrealized technology in terms of conflict, the majority of thinking about South American security um, you know, in a maritime sense is about the surface threat, not the submarine threat. Um, and by the time that we get to 1914, uh, the, I think we had equipped 39 ships as uh, defensive war merchant ships in order to try to meet that um, German cruiser threat. So um, I'll just say a quick few words to sum up because I'm doing quite okay for time. Um, by the eve of the war, the Admiralty had assessed that Germany's regular cruisers were too few to be an issue. And if you look at Corbett's thinking um, in the run up to the First World War about the German cruiser threat, the regular cruiser threat being dealt with pretty quickly, um, he's sort of proven right. 
but it's the auxiliary cruisers, those German ships which are fitted out as, as raiders, which are causing the real headache for the Admiralty. And as we have seen, rather than the trust being placed in international law or in essence, in essence, regular um, naval deployments, it's the sort of the, the, the middle policy the, or, the, or the part job or, or taking what you can in terms of the resources available to fit out um, British merchant shipping in a defensive capacity, which sits at the heart of strategy on the outbreak of the First World War for defending this important South American trade. So I think in that sense, you know, there are many, and when I talk to my third year lawyers about international, um, international law, and they, they look at this, this period following the Declaration of Paris, the Interdeck Hague Conventions, etc., it's also like the birth of not just international law, but concepts of the international community. And that's all, that's all fine and well. But from my perspective, if there's one significant learning point from looking at this period, it's in essence the failure of international law. And why does international law fail? It fails for the reasons international law tends to fail, which is it's not in the national interests of states, whether it's Germany or whether it's Britain, to subscribe to policies and law which will harm either their national interests or their ability to conduct warfare on a, on a, on a, on a scale or of a type which is necessary to deal a blow to their expected enemy. And because of the Hague Conference of 1907 and the London Conference of 1909, Germany refused to guarantee its merchantmen would not be turned into commerce raiders because of course, why would they give that guarantee when that is their best way to harm British interests if the, if the high seas fleet can't escape the North Sea? Um, the British response is a symmetrical one in terms of looking for a similar, similar, um, a similar way ahead. So if Germany's got our merchants and um, ships as auxiliary cruisers, then that is really the only response set against pressing international commitments to focus upon, upon European waters and the inherent value of the trade. Because as Ivan Bloch wrote in 1898, um, if you can't eat, you can't fight. And the primacy of protecting that sea lane of communication, while visible in British thinking, wasn't necessarily enacted until war actually breaks out in 1914. Okay, I think that's probably enough from me. Um, I hope that was interesting. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of thinking, a piece of work that I've been sort of, sort of uh, pushing along with for uh, a number of years and the inability to get into archives <laughs> over the past 18 months has, has, has limited the, the ability to work on this. But it's something I, I'm developing as this broader construct of certainly in a maritime sense, why debates about international law, as noble, or international maritime law, as noble as they are, why do they fall down? And as the, as the, the, the arch realist, it's you know, a fundamental thing that certainly in this period, states will be states. And we can see that about debates about, um, about I'm sorry, merchant shipping, about the conversion of merchant shipping, but we can also see that in debates, which I'm sure you've discussed already, about how, the First World War will be conducted, and that you know disagreement between the practitioners um, whose job it is to win, and some of the legal arguments, and, and Corbett himself um, being on this side of the debate, that thinking about the, the primacy of international law. Well, as we know, that falls down pretty rapidly, and it's not just in 1914. What I've looked at, um, concept of international maritime law, are breaking down as, as early as 1907. So. That's, that's enough for me. Delighted to, to field any questions. Um, thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you for that, Martin. That was super, super interesting. Um, I, I will just kick off with a, with a small question because this is certainly not my era of expertise. How much, if any, role did the South American governments have in this debate? Did they have stakes in being neutral nations? Did they have stakes in the company? Exceeding, were they involved at all in this debate? Um, a small part. Um, if you look at the, the example of um, Brazil, for instance, Brazil is very keen on that neutral role, that neutrality, that um, essentially, let, let, you know, let's think about it as, in a sense of, you know, um, 
Export trade is really, really important, as is overseas financing and investments in the development of, say, the Brazilian economy, the Argentine economy. So they don't really want anything to rock the boat. But they're hampered, and although they, they've gone through a period of, um, of trying to look after their own interests by um, naval expansion in the 19th century, by the time we get to, to this period, um, clearly in, in terms of the, the, the work that I've looked at in terms of the British and German thinking, there is no concept at all of, say, the Argentine perspective or the Brazilian perspective or even the Chilean perspective. This is very much seen as a, as a, as a, as a Northern Hemisphere external conflict being you know, taken to South American um, waters and ports, largely for European national interests, whether they're German interests, or whether they're or whether they're British interests. I mean, the other interesting aspect here is the role of the United States, because uh, many people in this conversation are aware. Um, there's thinking within British circles that um, this is a massive opportunity. The first of all, it's a huge opportunity to clean out those German companies which are controlling either um, wheat processing, certainly aspects of the canning trade in terms of um, the preservation of, of foodstuffs. And this seems a great opportunity to basically blacklist German companies and uh, force them out of business, and then British companies will take them over. But of course, by creating the vacuum, what happens is the greater um, competitive aspects of the US economy means the United States then steps in to take over those roles. And again, you know, there's very little, from what I've seen, debate, whether it's in British or, or German or United States circles, about the national interests of say Brazil or Argentina, this is, you know, informal empire by, you know, empire by essentially informal arrangement. It's, 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 it's taking a dominant, almost hegemonic position in the global trading environment and use it to maximize one's own interests. Now, obviously Brazil, Argentina, et cetera, benefit from this trade, but in no way is it done on equal terms. And I think that's reflected certainly in some of the discussions about one protecting of uh, or the protection of, say, South American aspects of South American neutrality, and that was infringed a, a number of times in the First World War, but also about um, their their voice in terms of inputting into what international law looks like. I mean, uh, you know, if you're thinking about this in a systemic way, if you're not inputting into the system significantly, you don't have a voice, and I think. If you look at the difference between, say, the pre-First World War period, the interwar period, and post-1945, um, I think one of the most significant changes um, in that construct of what the international community thinks international law is for, is there are more voices in that debate post-1945 than there are at this at the period that I'm looking at in terms of, say, 1900 to 1940, which I know is a very long and convoluted answer to your question, <laughs> but, um, you know, we all get paid to talk, so we all quite like to talk, don't we? No, absolutely. No, no, that was great. That was perfect. Thank you. Um, I know that Greg has a question and then uh, Marta also has a question. So, Greg, let's uh, let's go with you. No, let's go with Marta first. Well, that's fine, too. All right. Thanks, Greg. Um, and thanks, Martin. Um, I, have a, I have a question because um, my conceptualization of international law is quite different from yours, and I study the same period, um, which is all as it should be, of course. Um, but I'm wondering whether you're overstating the separation between national interests and, and international law, and if you're almost overstating the nobility of, of, of international law at the time, um, and even uh, whether you're uh, underselling Latin American voices in the formation of international law, because 1907, they were at The Hague and they were very loud and, and, and very uh, uh, proud. Um, and, I, and it's really more about nuancing what you said. I, I don't disagree that there is planning for war and there is planning among the British for war with Germany. But I, I do think that there is also a planning, there is no conception of the First World War is is going to happen, right? So, so um, we have that knowledge they didn't. And I think there is, in, in much of what you say, there's real issue about how do we protect our various futures? And so 
auxiliary cruisers are absolutely central to this because it might bring back the age of privateering. It might bring back this, this fear of merchants going out as merchants or seeming like they're merchants and, they're, uh, and then turning them into warships at sea. And if we lose control of that, then we lose control of, of global trade, our imperial connections and all this trade. And that would be true whether Britain would be at war or not. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, 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 so not so much about sort of thinking about what a war with Germany might look like, but what it might look like if Germany was at war, but Britain was neutral uh, in this period, because um, um, I'm seeing when I read these sources and I, I admittedly look more at the foreign policy, foreign office ones and the legal ones, as opposed to the admiralty ones. So this is where that contestation about what, what the roles of various um, 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 institutions uh, um, in the formation of planning at state level um, plays, of course. Um, how do you see this, the admiralty engaging with the possibility that there might be a future in which Britain is neutral and in which these auxiliary German auxiliary cruisers might be become belligerent? How does that play in their conceptions of, uh, of what they are planning for? I think in terms of the, the big issue is I think a disconnect between concepts of, of national policy and those charged with the formulation of strategy to deal with specific threats and challenges. And you can, you can see this um, time and time again between um, tension between, say, the Admiralty and the Foreign Office, which, which I mean, you, you alluded to in terms of, if we're dealing with this in a, in a higher level, in terms of the formulation and implementation of British policy, how is that linking or not linking into the practitioners who are thinking about solving naval issues and naval problems from this perspective? And you can you can see this in um, in the work of Otley or, or Slade, etc., who you get the feeling of being quite frustrated in the sense that as practitioners, um, they, they they have a role. And obviously, Hakon and the, the London Conference. Slade is there um, as, a, as a main delegate in terms of trying to represent naval, the naval strategists approach to solving problems set against concepts of national interest. So I think there is a, there is a, a disconnect there in terms of the way in it's, in it's specifically something that I think in this period the Admiralty struggle with as opposed to say the war office in terms of planning for a future conflict either in Europe or Britain's role on the side of a future conflict. Because the Admiralty is charged with a broader remit than, say, the War Office. Um, the Admiralty is charged with not just looking at the threat um, in, a, in a symmetrical way from either, either France or Russia or Germany, but it's also charged with the security of those vital arteries in a way the War Office isn't. So I think the Admiralty is going almost through a, a, a sort of a, a period of contextualizing how does it defend. British interests in the round on a global level, when you have a disconnect between policy and strategy, but also within the naval service itself, I mean, the, the fishing barrels industry being a classic example of this, about exactly how to do that in terms of security in home waters or security overseas. And if you can't provide for security overseas, who helps you out? Of course, leading to the debate with France about taking on Mediterranean security in order to allow that greater concentration of, 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 um, of effort in the, in the North Sea. And I think, I mean, and you mentioned privateers is quite interesting because I think one of the, one of the, one of the developments that you've got going on in this period is the enhanced ability to sort of have a, a more controlled approach to a of course. So it's not just a case of sending out privateers with letters of mark to, to ravage um, with economic self-interest enemy trade. It's the ability to take up um, shipping in an auxiliary role and control it in, a, in a, almost like a state-sponsored proxy and control it to a degree with um, developments in wireless technology, etc. And I think the fear is of a highly coordinated German offensive in the very start of a, a conflict, whether it's wars declared or whether it's that pre-war into conflict period, which is going to significantly um, damage uh, the British food supply, um, which is a significant issue for the Admiralty, um, whether 
and whether policymakers actually fundamentally get the nature of the danger, I'm, I'm still not entirely convinced, but this is a significant concern for many within the admiralty itself, um, given the fact that they are charged with protection, and, then the, and if this doesn't work, they're going to get the blame, and they're going to be held accountable for this in some way, shape, or form. Um, and in terms of neutrality, um, I think, I mean, I know that and looking at the, the, the I'm sorry, I, I couldn't make your talk, but looking at the title in terms of might is right, and again, you've got this feeling within the naval service that within the construct of the Anglo Anglo German relations, within the construct of, of economic conflict, within the construct of, of what Germany can do to harm the UK to either keep us out or force us out of the conflict once it starts. Um, the biggest opportunity that Germany has maybe is not, you know, the traditional invasion of the British Isles scare, but it's the ability to affect British um, British trade, British supply lines, etc. And that therefore, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at naval thinking of this period, I, mean, I think you find it hard maybe to think of and conceive of, you know, a, a broader European conflict of which British interests are at stake and Britain remaining neutral on the sidelines. Now, I'm not as familiar with the Foreign Office file, I'll say, as you are more so the Admiralty files. But I think thinking like the practitioners did about the reality of this, um, it is about planning for a future war with initially Russia, France, but then increasingly so Germany, of which that war will inevitably escalate and spread into, into South America and South American waters and British interests there. Thank you. It's a good question. Thank you very much. No, that was great, Martin. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move to a question that's in the chat from John Bodie. I'm sorry if, if I mispronounced that. Um, so John says, uh, what a fantastic lecture. Thank you. And he goes on to say, I was wondering if you could comment on the modern interpretation of your ideas regarding international humanitarian law. That is, do you feel the same state interests apply today in regard to political interests taking supremacy over legal theory or law in the same manner as they did in 1907 to 1918? Um, thank you, John, for your, for your kind comments. Um, in terms of when we look at concepts of, say, national interest versus human rights today, um, not all states are the same. I mean, we must recognize that. In Western liberal democracies like ourselves, we we have a um, we, we we do have a different interpretation of the role that human rights and whether they sit as a priority than other parts of the world. Um, I think that also sits within the construct of of the international community and things like RTP responsibility to protect, which you know the UK has used itself as a as a justification for action. Think about Libya in twenty eleven but then non-action in Syria in 2013. So the human rights aspect of this is, is significant in terms of, say, the UK's interpretation of the world around it. But I suspect that human rights don't necessarily sit very high on Vladimir Putin's list of priorities unless Russian human rights are being, um, or, or, or being um, infringed, maybe in um, Eastern Ukraine or in the Baltic states, etc. So I think, you know, they are... We have seen the concept of human rights being weaponized to a degree by states to achieve their national interests. Um, I'm, a, I'm a liberal realist. I'd like the world to be a nice, fluffy place where everybody's great for each other, but sometimes you've got to do bad things. So, you know, I think it, it would be, it, it's, I think it's very problematic to categorize states as states when we need to maybe think about. And again, it's one of the criticisms of the Western liberal rules-based international order that it is a Western liberal rules-based international order, which might not suit, say, China's way of thinking about how it um, achieves its interests, either internally as a sovereign nation or um, externally in, say, the way it acts in the South China Sea. I think we have to realize that there are different interpretations about human rights globally. Now, as an international community, we can agree on many things, say, to the United Nations. The hard part of strategy is getting it to work in practice, where people fundamentally disagree on aspects. And I think in that sense, um, you know, when, it, when push comes to show, national interests in many cases still trump the concept of human rights. Now, 
that's not necessarily a good thing, but we have to we, we have to call it as we see it. Well, that's great. Thank you, Martin. I think you know if if this conference has shown anything is that there is a fascinating tension always between conceptions of international law and strategic thinking. And clearly in the maritime sphere, this is very much true, um, which is great because because that's what we hoped would come out of this. Um, Greg, I'm going to give you the last question of this panel um, and then move on to our final panel. Thanks, Anna. Uh, just a quick one then, Martin. Um, changing nature of, you mentioned this kind of humanitarian and the food link. Um, debates, schools of thought within the, the Admiralty that actually the indiscriminate use now of, of a general food blockade was immoral, or unethical, and or illegal. Uh, was there much of that prior to the outbreak of the war? To be honest, Greg, I don't know, because I haven't been looking at blockades specifically, in the sense that if we're thinking about this in terms of economic and humanitarian consequences of economic activity, which is essentially, you know, uh, you know is starving civilians to death a legitimate use of, of state power? Um, yes, because that's the nature of blockade. Um, as you know, the, the huge amount of work done by people like by Nick Lambert, and you already mentioned Kwame Armageddon in, in, the, in the previous session about, about the reality of understanding that blockade is a, you know, it, it's not a soft tool. It's a hard tool. Why? Because people will die because of it. It may take them longer, and it's not like they've got these bombs on their heads. But we're talking about the blockade of food stuffs means means you know the, the death of women and children. Um, I think from the work that I have seen and, and the thinking I have done, this is done in a very detached way. And while the concern is always for one's own and the effect on one's own population, etc. And that, you know, cutting the South American supply line is going to be highly detrimental to UK food supplies. It's often seen from, from what I have seen as a political concern in the sense that um, if we're thinking about blockade as a tool to stall enemy populations to make them rise up and overthrow their, their governments, uh, as a way to force government to do maybe a more uh, a less permissive line of, of policy. This figures um, quite often. But I think, and, and maybe it's the nature of the times, and maybe it's the nature of the, the naval approach to this, which is often detached from those large population centers upon land where you can see this. I mean, you know, you know navies complain about sea blindness from policy. Well, of course, navies are also often blind to the effect of what they do and how it happens and the impact upon people land. In the same way that maybe sort of you know student bombardments in the Second World War detached themselves from, from, from what they were doing, so I think in that case, Greg. I mean, although I have looked um, at the at, at, yeah, admiralty files on this, I haven't seen things that make it it, it figure highly. But of course, we're talking about official documentation, um, and I think there's there's concern, but. There's a strategic realization that you know war is a nasty group of business and that people get killed. Um, and you want to hope that you, you lose less of your people than the casualties you inflict upon the other side. And if that shortens the war, then that's maybe a good thing in terms of the way that um, people are approaching this thinking. I know that's quite a woolly answer to your question, Greg, and I'm not trying to avoid the issue. Um, but it's certainly something that I think needs further investigation. Um, once, once we can get back into archives to do that, so that that was a that was a that was a sort of straight back one for that, <laughs> to that one, Greg. But it's an important aspect because I think when we think about areas that have not been traditionally covered, certainly in terms of either either naval work or maritime work, um, the impact of things that happen at sea on land. Um, it is integral. I mean, that's why we, that's why naval operations, that's why maritime warfare is conducted. It's to have an impact upon political entities, upon societies, to make them change their policy, you know, to impose one will upon the other. Um, and I think the humanization and the humanizing aspect of that are, are, are as yet possibly untapped areas for further research. Thanks, Martin. Cheers. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Anna.
All right, brilliant. Thank you so much, Martin, for a wonderful paper and, and a wonderful um, Q&A session.